The MoFi Source Point Triple Eight checks every box for me personally. Linear speaker, check. Good estimated in room response, check. Wide horizontal radiation for a good sound stage width, check. Wide vertical radiation for the ability to sit or stand, depending on what you need to do in a room while you're listening to music or watching television, check. And that's the key. Remember that one. Low distortion, check. Low compression, check. Now, does it do this? Low frequency extension, check. This thing gets down to about 30, 35 hertz in room with anechoic F3 of 34 hertz. It checks every box that I could want. And how much does it cost? $5,000. Now, does that scare you? $5,000? It might. You know, like, I'll be honest, sometimes after reviewing more expensive speakers, I kind of lose touch with what budget really means. But then I've got other speakers that are coming up that are like two or 300 bucks. So that keeps me grounded. $5,000, I will tell you, objectively speaking, and, and when I say that, I mean based off of data, which gives me compression, linearity, distortion, low frequency extension, soundstage radiation, width and height, and just how good is a directivity, meaning... Does it spread the sound into the room evenly at different frequencies? Because a lot of speakers have trouble doing that. The speaker does all those things and it does it for $5,000. Finding another speaker that does that is very hard to do. Now, there are speakers that might cost $3,000 or $4,000 a pair, and they're still great speakers, but they're bookshelf speakers. And if they go low, then they give up a lot of sensitivity. We're talking low 80s. If they go higher in sensitivity, then they give up low frequency extension. And most of them tend to have more narrow radiation than I want. So I have yet to find a speaker that checks all of these boxes at $5,000. The closest one that I've come to is probably the Kef Reference One Meta, which I don't remember what its F3 is. I don't think it gets quite as low. It doesn't have quite the soundstage radiation width. And that speaker costs about $10,000 per pair. And it's a bookshelf size speaker, but it's a big old bookshelf speaker. The next one that I can think of that would check all of those boxes, except it doesn't quite check the soundstage radiation. It's a little bit more narrow than the MoFi Source Point Triple Eight. That would be the Kef Blade 2 Meta. Now, to me, that's kind of like, that's end game for, for my personal self. That is a... Fantastic sounding speaker. It's super linear. It's more linear than the MoFi 888. It has better distortion values, I believe. I think its compression is a little bit better, but it costs roughly six times the price of the MoFi at about $29,000 per pair. $29,000 per pair versus $5,000 per pair. Oh, and the MoFi to me looks fantastic. This nice walnut finish. I mean, it's a beautiful looking speaker to me. You don't have to worry about finagling. Where am I going to put the speaker? Does it have to do this? Does it have to be positioned this way in order to get the best sound? Do I have to use absorption to capture some off-axis reflections that are going to make the speaker sound otherwise bright or potentially not as dynamic, depending on where the issue in the crossover is? You don't have that issue with this particular speaker. And that is why I can say with confidence that this is truly the best speaker that I've come across at the $5,000 mark or below. And I would have to go back and make sure, but I think I might, I might even rank this as one of the best speakers I've reviewed flat out. Like in my mind, and this is purely subjective, okay? Like, and this could change next week, but in my mind, it's probably top three at this point. The two that I'm really placing up there would be the Kefla 2 Meta and then the Dutch and Dutch HC. Now there's the JBL 4367, which is a fantastic speaker. There's a JBL M2, another fantastic speaker. There's the March Audio, but that one's a really good speaker at like $4,000 per pair, but it's more narrow. It's very low in sensitivity. So that would kind of be the, the disqualifier for me as far as why it's not higher up on the list. Without going too far down the rabbit hole, the MoFi Source Point 888 is, is probably in my top three of, of all that I've heard and reviewed personally thus far. And that's a list of almost 200 speakers at this point in time, with a lot of them being well over $5,000, okay? So I don't 
say that lightly because I don't want to be the, the typical YouTuber who says, oh, this is the best thing ever, and then it changes in a month. The stuff that I'm talking about that are still ranked above this are speakers that I've, the Dutch and Dutch was one of the, it's the second speaker I ever reviewed, Dutch and Dutch HC. Uh, the 4367 I reviewed two years ago. The Kefblay 2 Meta, I just heard that like three months ago, but I've been wanting to hear that for over a year. This speaker is all that in a bag of chips. And if you're on the fence about should you get this speaker or not, I unequivocally can say, yeah, definitely get the speaker. You can point the speakers at you. That's the best way that I found. You can point them slightly off axis at 10 to 15 degrees, which is typically how you would want to aim a coaxial speaker. And when I say, how should you aim it? This is what I'm talking about. Zero degrees in black is on axis. Red is 30 degrees off axis pointed straight out to the room. On axis is always pointed at you directly at the listener, and that is zero degrees. When I talk about how far you need to bring the speaker from the wall, this is what I'm talking about. Now, the manual for this speaker suggests two to four feet off the wall, the back wall. And that's what this graphic is showing. It's reference from the back of the speaker to the wall behind the speaker. I found that two feet was kind of the sweet spot. If I brought them too far out into the room, like three feet, I didn't feel like I got enough base extension. Even though the F3 on the speaker is very low and it does qualify as practically a full range speaker other than maybe 20 hertz. If you bring it too far off the wall, you might find like I did that you just want a little bit more base. So putting it a little bit closer to the wall will help that. But I would not advise moving it closer than two feet to the wall because because this speaker gets so low, it might sound a little bit too boomy in the 40 to 50 hertz region. That's what I found in my room. Now, of course you can use equalization and typically equalization is best used below about four to 500 hertz because of the size and the dimensions of the room that cause modal issues, a lot of resonance, a lot of buildup of the sound waves, which are gonna be droning, just and just light up the room. Typically that's where you wanna use equalization is below that point. But if you don't have equalization, you're a purist or something of that nature, then this is why I suggest bringing the speakers out about two feet from the wall. I think you're gonna be best served that way. And again, I would point them directly at you or maybe slightly off axis, about 10 degrees. In my opinion, if you go 30 degrees off axis, you're gonna lose a little bit too much top end. Now, the beauty of the speaker is that it still works very well that way. So maybe you're trying to get a wide dispersion area because you have a living room set up or a home theater set up where you wanna use these and you wanna cover as much room as possible. Like if you like to entertain, I have friends come over and they sit off axis like completely to the side of these speakers and they still hear vocals very well. We have we actually watched Axel F the other night. Nobody complained about it, none, none of my friends. Gleb, I know you're watching. You didn't complain about it. Craig didn't complain about it. And Anthony didn't complain about it, but maybe, maybe they don't care either. I don't know, but I will just say that the wide dispersion area of these speakers at 60 degrees gives you a little bit more room to place these directly on axis and get that top end without losing the sound stage width and you still keep good precise imaging. Okay, now let's look at some of the data and I'll walk you through how that relates to what I actually heard. Let me talk about some of the specs real fast while I show you a little bit of a video of these set up in my living room. It is a three-way vented box design with a concentric driver. The concentric driver is a coaxial driver. Now that coaxial driver is an eight inch mid-range to a one and a quarter inch dome tweeter. There are two woofers on the bottom, both eight inch, and they're crossed over at approximately 130 hertz. There are two large ports on the back, but that's it on the back. Weight is about 96 pounds. Height is about 42 inches. Depth is about 16 inches. And width is about 12 and a half inches. And for those of you who are not in the US, that means the height is 1070 millimeters, 410 millimeters for the depth and 320 millimeters for the width and come in at 43 kilograms. All the data that you're about to see is captured using the Eclipple near field scanner. And this is a quick picture of it set up in my garage. And you can see that the MoFi is sitting proudly on top of this. The impedance looks clean. I don't see any major resonances there. Too. There appears to be something around 550 Hertz, a little bit of a blip there, but I don't really see any issues with that in particular. I certainly didn't hear any issues with that. The main thing to notice is that the minimum EPDR is 4.2 ohm, but the minimum impedance is 5 ohm, which means that this speaker isn't an incredibly hard load to drive, unlike some of the speakers I've recently tested. This is the on-axis linearity and the listening window. Average sensitivity I measured was about 85.6 decibels. The linearity does take a bit of a dip around 
one and a half kilohertz right in here. And you can see that overall the tweeter level appears to be about one and a half decibels lower than the mid range. But when you see the estimated in room response, I believe that this is done intentionally to get a smoother in room response. And I will say that I tried to equalize this up just using a shell filter. And when I did, I didn't really like it anymore. F3 measured at 34 Hertz, F10 at 26 Hertz. This is the CEA 2034 data set. Pay attention to the early reflections directivity and the sound power directivity. Now we see there's a dip around uh, about three kilohertz or so. I'm gonna jump back up and see if I see anything going on there. Uh, maybe not so much in terms of diffraction, a little bit of maybe a diffraction element evidenced by this change in the green over the black. Basically the listening window is averaged up a little bit higher than the on-axis response. So maybe there's a little bit of a diffraction element going on there, which is causing this right here. But otherwise, both directivity indices look really, really good. Estimated interim response and the blue line indicating how I pretty much heard the speaker. So the one thing that I really wanted to point out here is notice how the red 30 degrees versus the black on axis zero degrees, they line up very well starting at about, let's say this about maybe 500 Hertz or so. I mean, there's just a steady one, one and a half decibel difference in those two. Now that means that you have the ability to position the speaker in different ways and it's still going to sound roughly the same. I mean, obviously it's going to have a little bit less air if it's not pointed directly at you, but for the most part, the tonality is going to be very, very similar. That works out great for home theater enthusiasts or people who are entertaining for multiple people sitting around or standing even. You're going to hear pretty much the same tonality. Nice in-room extension to about 30 hertz. Horizontal radiation plus or minus 60 degrees. It's pretty smooth. We do again have this little bit of a diffraction element here at around 3K and maybe a little bit of another one. It could just be baffle. I'm not 100% sure, but to me, these aren't big enough deals to worry about. Vertical is about plus or minus 50 degrees. Now you may be wondering why isn't it the same as the horizontal because it's a coaxial driver. But remember, this is a tower speaker with two eight inch drivers spaced pretty far apart. And because of that, you're gonna lose some vertical matching on that lower frequency area. So that's why it's closer to about 50 degrees rather than the plus or minus 60 degrees that the higher frequency area tends to follow. Not bad, but just letting you know that's why. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, below 1%, 1% is negative 40 decibels. At 96 decibels, pretty good above the 200 Hertz region. So basically the mid range and beyond, it's below 1%. You do have an increase around 100 Hertz down to about 50 Hertz or so. Mostly second order harmonic distortion, so not a big deal. What about multitone distortion? Again, really good. It's below 3% and it's mostly below 1%. And this is full range with those eight inch woofers moving. What happens if you don't allow the eight inch woofers to move as much? You cross it over at 80 Hertz like you would maybe to a subwoofer. Not a lot of difference. What about the dynamic range? Wow, this is really good. Now this is the level of what I've seen from something like the March audio, which is a sensitivity of around 81 decibels and costs about 4,000 USD per pair. Uh, the same thing for the Kef reference one meta, super low compression on that speaker, but about nine or $10,000 a pair. And then the same thing for the Kef Blade two meta, which is about 28, 29, $30,000 a pair. So this guy at $5,000 a pair is holding his own very, very well. And that does it for this review. As I've said multiple times, this speaker checks all the boxes for me. I think it would check pretty much every box for most people. I mean, for me, the looks, it just looks great. And you can see that it kind of matches the furniture that I've got going on. I'd be lying if I said I didn't choose that furniture because I thought I was gonna buy these, but to be honest with you, I don't know if I can afford them right now, even though I could get them at dealer cost, that's not a problem. Uh, I've just run into some unexpected expenses. Like I've had to repair the clippable control boxes. 720 bucks and I cracked a rim on my car that was $330 to replace for a used rim. So those unexpected things are gonna kind of probably keep me from buying anything else at this point in time. But with that said, I would wholeheartedly recommend buying these. Try to get them from your local dealer if you can. And if you can't, then order them from a place where they have a good return policy. So maybe you get them in and you just find that they're not the right fit for you for whatever reason. Then you can send them back. And yes, I'm going to cheap plug myself here. I have an affiliate link for Crutchfield. If you want to order it through Crutchfield, that gives me a small percentage of commission at no additional cost for you. And if you're worried about shilling, just look at the number of speakers that I reviewed that cost more than this that I've said no. And look at the speakers that I've reviewed in general that I've said, hell no. Okay. It's not about shilling. It's just about saying, hey, if you're going to buy it anyway,
do me a solid, order it through that link. If you don't like links or affiliate links, just don't bother with it. But at least I'm being honest and upfront about how I help generate income for this channel, okay? But I really am confident in saying that I'd be really surprised if you ordered these speakers and you didn't like them. But listen, everybody has their reasons. So who knows? You might have your own for not liking them, but I just, I would be surprised. Maybe you just like a really nonlinear speaker. That would be probably the only exception. Home theater, can these do it for home theater? Absolutely, why? Low compression, low distortion, excellent directivity. All three of those really matter. And if you've watched my video about what the difference is between a home theater and an audiophile type speaker is, that's it. It's can you EQ it to the sound you want? Because some cheaper speakers, maybe they're not good on axis or not really good linearity, but they have good directivity, which means they can be EQ'd very well to sound a certain way. Do they take power? Can they get loud? And do they keep low distortion and low compression? These do. So that checks the three main boxes for a home theater requirement speaker for me or a home theater speaker requirement for me. Hope that made sense. Anyway, uh, if you would like to support this channel, there's a few ways you can do it. Patreon.com. You can join me for behind the scenes info, early releases and polls and discussions, things of that nature. Alternatively, you can just use one of my affiliate links. As I said earlier, I'm going to have an affiliate link for this. If you think that makes me a shill, that's cool. I'm probably not going to be able to convince you otherwise, but just consider all the other speakers I reviewed still put affiliate links for it and then told you I freaking hated it. Like the Heresy 4, the Eclipse Heresy 4 is one of the worst speakers I've ever heard. But I think I've had one or two people buy those through the affiliate link, even though I've said, I don't watch the speaker. Other clip speakers are good, but that one is just abysmal. Okay. All right. So with that said, I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.